Welcome to the second uh, IRP public webinar of the month of April. Uh, my name is Guillermo Aguad from the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management. Uh, first of all, I want to mention that the, the idea of this webinar came at the IRP staff retreat uh, meeting uh, a few uh, weeks ago where we were exploring and trying to better understand the topic of collaborations. So um, we invited Paul, since he created a very particular uh, collaboration that you are going to hear about in a few minutes. And um, also I want to thank Paul for donating his time um, out of his uh, personal vacation, and especially his wife, uh, Rigmore, uh, who is here also. So. Um, Welcome, Paul, and uh, Professor Wasman, or Paul as I call him, uh, studied at the University of uh, Bergen. He studied chemistry, biology, geophysics, and psychology, and he uh, has a PhD in Bergen on pelagic benthic coupling in fields of uh, different productivity. He did a postdoc with benthic ecologist Professor John Gray at the University of Oslo. Since 1988, he has been at the Arctic University of uh, Norway, in Tromsø, Norway. He has worked in fjords, shelf seas, and the enti entire Barents Sea, while using system ecological approach, pelagic benthic coupling, and modeling. He's the founder of the Arctos Network, the Arctos uh, PhD School for Arctic Marine Biolo uh, Ecology, and also the Arctic Frontiers Conference. Additionally, Professor Wasman is the head of the European Union project Arctic Tipping Points and uh, was also the chair of the Nansen Legacy Project until the summer of last year. Paul, the floor is yours. Welcome. Thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, so I will uh, go directly ahead and I talk about how this uh, scientific mission Nansen Legacy was uh, created. Uh, it is uh, funded by the Norwegian government and the Research Council, and is an interdisciplinary research project on the ecosystem of the Barents Sea, which is the gateway to the changing Arctic. It will run from 2018 to 23, and uh, below there you see the 10 institutions which are involved uh, in the project. and. Um, uh, this is probably everybody who is still doing Arctic research in Norway. Um, it is headed by uh, the PI is Marit Eichstar, and there are two other ones from the University of Bergen and Orens. And the entire thing is inspired by a mountain, which I will not come into here. Um, let me start with the dimension of the Nansen legacy. Uh, it assembles uh, most of Norway's Arctic oceanographers, 120, 130 people. It creates 50 new recruiting positions. Uh, the volume is 97 million uh, US. And um, if you look for the relative dimension to the United States, you can multiply everything with 65. There's only 5 million people living in Norway. You can see that this is a major uh, project uh, for Norway. <clears throat> and it's also centered around Norway's new icebreaker, which research icebreaker, which just arrived in Norway. It looks like this. Front and this from the side. <clears throat> I am the former chair of the board from 2012 to 16. And uh, I can tell you that there will be a dedicated talks regarding the structure and the function of the Nansen legacy in Washington, organized at the embassy here on the 3rd and 4th and 5th of June. And Marit Rexler uh, will come and give the talks. And um, so this is uh, Marit. And the contact here is Alf Hul, where for which you have an email address. He is presently working. Uh, at the um, uh, ambassy, Norwegian embassy and was my um, the second in command when I was chair chairing the Nansen legacy. 
so he will know where uh, the talks or the one talk will take place. Maybe that there is a talk also at the uh, National, National Academy, Academy of Science. Of Science. Sorry, sorry. Can you it? I continue? Yes. So why should Norway have such a project? Uh, licenses in Norway uh, for ocean activity are given by the Norwegian government. That's uh, nothing particular. But what is mandatory for a license of industrial activity in Norwegian waters? For that, you need a sustainability report. And that sustainability report can also be examined by the parliament. And the parliament can go back to the government and say, well, we need more reporting or we don't think that the sustainability report is good enough. So sustainability is the very base of ecosystem management in Norway, uh, which is uh, knowledge based and it has long traditions right from the 70s. And uh, what does sustainability mean? Uh, there are many uh, different versions of that word uh, right now and uh, in our case it refers to the carrying capacity of an ecosystem on decades for decades or longer and the question is will the industrial in activity be impacted uh, will the ecosystem be impacted by the industrial activity that's what the sustainability report has to focus upon then the government has to decide, okay, we take the chance or we don't do it. So for the permanent ice-free barren sea region, um, uh, they, we have uh, quite uh, a significant knowledge. And here you see the various uh, zones, uh, sea zones of Norway. So this is on the uh, barren sea, which is ice-free. And this uh, black lines show you where the winter ice usually is placed. For the open water, we have uh, adequate knowledge. And um, in close cooperation with Russia, uh, the Barents Sea is probably the best managed subarctic and Arctic ecosystem that can be discussed, but I think it's like that, with record high fish population. The cod population uh, for the time being is as high as in 1949 when they were the first time made uh, the first assessment. So the systemic investigations of the ecosystems that started in the 1980s by the Norway's first national research team, Promare, and there were follow-ups. So, um, so the tradition uh, of ecosystem study is multidisciplinary. And um, some of the information from that region you can find in this book here to the left, Ecosystem Barency. And then for the start of the Nansen legacy, we summarized uh, the knowledge north of Svalbard uh, in this recently published book, which some of you have seen. So, but for the uh, hitherto ice covered northernmost region, uh, that uh, knowledge or the adequate knowledge of the ecosystem based management is missing. So for that region, uh, we cannot make sustainability reports. So it prevents Norway uh, to become industrially active in the high north with regard to oil, gas, minerals, and tourism. And in order to become fully operational in the high north, the Nantes legacy is sort of is the indispensable tool which Norway has to become so. So licenses for the Norwegian sector uh, in the north, which is ice covered. Uh, can then be provided after 2023 and onwards. So how can the adequate ecosystem knowledge be acquired? That was our question. What procedure should be applied to solve such a grand question? And here I start with a more general thing, uh, which is behind our thinking. And that's about major national questions and their potential solutions. If you uh, allow me to say this is a, this is a country, the realm of the country, uh, then the problems of that country in this blue line will then be solved by different institutions, the Meteorological Agency, the Institute of Marine Research, uh, and so on and so on. So then they serve the questions which a country has. 
Now, institutions uh, are usually uh, permanent. They continue true to what they do, and they continue doing so. But the problem of the country may change by climate politics and so on. So sooner or later, you may run into a problem where some of the problems of the countries are not served anymore by its institutions in the proportion you considered. And you have, for example, a field like that. And how should you then fill uh, that problem? And there are three principal solutions to this. One is that you make new institutions. And if you think that may cost too much money or this is not, uh, you are not uh, ready to do so, for example, an institution for the ice covered waters of the, of the Arctic or whatever, if you don't do that. And the next solution is that you make a network or force the institutions into some kind of network which then extend their expertise into the areas which have to be covered. So that is solution number two. And there's always a third one, and that is that you ignore that. So what we did is, uh, so we thought that to become operational adequate uh, for ecosystem-based knowledge from the hither to ice cover ground, this is indispensable. We have to do it. It's too important for Norway. So, and... Uh, on a few years' notice, the task is too big for any single uh, Norwegian institution to, to alone to uh, provide that knowledge. So then, should we then ignore the challenge because we cannot do the job by letting institutions compete on, uh, on that task? And then our solution was uh, make a national corporation and have a division of labor, including the development of new tools to organize and finance. And the challenge, in a way, is a concerted action on all levels. You have to unite and discuss with the scientists, the institutions, the funding agencies, and the government. Only together they can solve that. So then I shortly go run through you uh, the years and how the years passed by. The NITISH started by the Norwegian Academy of Sciences in summer 2011. Uh, we applied for funding from the government uh, to finance the process uh, to figure out if that was possible in 2012. The constitution meeting of the interim board started in December 2012. This is when my time started here. We appointed a working group in summer 2013. We made a science plan in March 2014. We made a research application, which was evaluated by the National Academy of Sciences here in Washington in November 2015. That was headed by Marit Reichster. Uh, we made an implementation plan in 2016 and 17 because we got the highest possible uh, marks from the National Academy of Sciences. Otherwise, probably the entire initiative would have been dead. Uh, then we constitute the board in 2017, uh, send an expanded application to the Research Council in 17, and, and that was approved. And then we started in March 2018, so seven years of uh, intensive work, in periods at least, intensive work. So the interim board had some questions and challenges. How are we going to do this? How should we organize the science, the logistics, the financing? What are the data we need? What questions have to be answered? Who are the main actors that are needed and in what proportions? Uh, and we uh, selected a bottom-up approach where scientists and basic science was, so to say, the driving force for the entire process. Uh, there are in every type of group, there are dynamics. And I could give a talk about the group dynamics uh, which we <laughs> went through. Uh, and I just mentioned a couple of words here. It needs some stamina and endurance <laughs> to cope with institutional ambitions 
hopes, self-esteem, how to get biggest and how to make one's mark, including my own institution <laughs> and me included. So uh, you have to um, talk a long time to uh, get these things into proportions. For the team working, we selected three principles uh, which are of generic character. First, we said everybody is allowed to participate in the team if they really would like to cooperate. So you have to be willing to cooperate, which is not always the case. Then the next principle is that you have to do a division of labor, meaning if you are mainly working on this and another one is working on the same thing in different proportion, you cannot say, I'm doing this and you don't do this. So you have to have a division of labor. So you have to cooperate, you have to divide the labor, and at the same time, and that is complicated, you have to give uh, institutions uh, the opportunity to concentrate. If you are doing modeling, yes, then also some other people are allowed to do modeling, but you can use that, uh, that project to become a better modeling institution so that your autonography, your biology, or like that, is not, uh, it, it's possible to develop. And um, <clears throat> you need to, need to have the necessary motivation for compromises to find solid solutions. So the basic science approach, I will talk only briefly on that, uh, to address that, was to use climatic gradients in the Northern Barren Sea and investigate along those gradients, for example, physical, biological interaction, ecosystem characteristics, timing, productivity, contaminants, bioproductivity variability, but also things like observations to improve prediction, modeling, and of course, you have to be put particular uh, uh, emphasis on the data legacy, because that legacy is then the base for the uh, uh, sustainability report for the future. So you have to make a thorough foundation for that. And a few words about the structure. Uh, we have research foci and research activities. And I think our biggest achievement was uh, uh, to make here some kind of textile engineering. Uh, uh, so this is a fabric of tightly woven parts. You have threads and warps, and um, you have to develop an un non unforeseen configuration. You have to put this together. Um, this is, so to say, the word version of what I've shown here. So there are four research foci and four research activities. On each of the foci and research activities are headed by a separate institution, and each uh, activity has a co-chair from another institution. So you make this type of uh, patchwork, uh, put this uh, textile together, and then together it means much more than each single column. Paul, why is it unforeseen configuration? Why? Why unforeseen? Yeah, be, uh, unforeseen, maybe that's the wrong word, but you have not seen this before. Oh, it sounds like it was unanticipated. Uh, maybe, yeah. Or do you mean it's no, I'm not, entirely not, new? Yeah, I understand. Unforeseen, uh, yeah. It, it is, uh, you get something which you couldn't imagine before. Okay. Uh, what was the So it's, it's a, something new in Norway. It's not, this has not been done in Norway before. Uh, no, what I want to say is that if you put the eight activities together together, you get a result which you could not plan out of the eight single ones. No, sure. It is the uh, no. synergy uh, which comes in, and there are, there are, this is an experiment, you don't know it before you have done it. The bigger picture. So shortly, I have to look at my watch here, pathway. Interim board partners met very intensively in the first year, uh, and uh, 
So we had one year with regular and let it go meetings, whatever comes up and we had to discussing uh, what has to be done, what is feasible, how can we do it. So after one year somewhere, we could see the phantoms of uh, something. Uh, and are the partners interested in cooperating and with what and how much and what are the conditions? Uh, who can provide the logistics we need for the, uh, for the questions? And we made a decision. We selected a very Norwegian principle, which is called splicing, uh, in, also in Norwegian. Uh, make a Dutch treat that have, I have from the dictionary. I have never heard that. But that's how things are done in Norway. Two, three or four ministers, uh, ministries like that, put things together in proportion to make this type of uh, together function. So each person pays their own way. Sorry? Each person pays for their own part. Going Dutch. Going Dutch. That's the yeah. Dutch treat. Yes. So it's both the ministries and the <coughs> research council and the institutions. They all have to gather in some proportion to make this uh, function. So, and one is, you know, you know, where the, the Norwegian institutions have funding for the state. So we offered 50% uh, of the funding from our own budget for that as our per, uh, our share. Is that included in the $97 million or that's? That's inside the, okay. So after one year of, the, of that, uh, we made pr a project groups with uh, people in their 30s, 40s and 50s, which then wrote the science plan. Uh, and we had uh, a lot of uh, meetings uh, with the science plan. Uh, we had also a lot of shared meetings of the board, which took maybe the, uh, uh, the bigger questions and the science uh, uh, group, which looked more for the details. Uh, the science plan of our national team cannot be evaluated inside the nation uh, because everybody knowledgeable person is legally incompetent and disqualified. <laughs> so that is a thing with national teams. They cannot be uh, evaluated by the nation. So, um, so because of that, we asked the National Academy of Science to do that. And they were willing to do that and we are very happy for that they use the time and energy for that. There is also a third pathway, and that is the government has a very passionate communication on the value of Norway's high north strategy. But it's very easy to speak about it, but uh, how to make the new economy in the north a reality that was partly falling and uh, given to us, or we took it. So there was an unpreparedness to solve this cake question. And the unpreparedness it was, among other things, is that nobody was thinking about how can this be funded? Because the funding structure has to be different from what we have been before. So Nansen Legacy is based on a consortium. And we talked to and anchored our endeavors with the leadership of our institutions continuously, meaning the deans and rectors and directors. We talk to all the rele re relevant ministries by asking, can we come and talk about that? And this is what we wish to do. We talk to the Research Council of Norway, which of course thought that also was challenging for them. And uh, so it's a national consortium that stands behind the and shape Nansen legacy. And then the various institutions and partners have done various things. Uh, beyond that, we had um, contacts with the gas and oil industry. Very often me, uh, me traveling around and telling what kind of plants we have. And this is something which interests you because that is, uh, will def depend that, that will this is the work necessary so that you will can apply for a license in the future um, went to the Atlantic Summit Science Week talked to the Norwegian Russian symposium on fisheries so that they were informed what we planned and then I had a visit to international 
institution organizations uh, who do deal with Arctic Ocean research. And uh, it was uh, along these lines I came to a National Science Foundation, and several around this table were sitting there and giving giving a talk. So. Um, if you select competition as the only appropriate mechanism for selection, then it may be difficult to form a national team, at least in a country of the size of Norway. And if you do not form a national team, you may solve the most significant. Uh, you may uh, form a national team. You may solve the most. Uh, you may not uh, solve the most significant challenges of the nation. There's a non. So I think the solution is to build up a united and, co united and coherent team that rests upon basic research and answers society's needs. And uh, you have to ask for appropriate support from all the involved partners. You have to evaluate the, scientific, the science by consortia outside the nation. And maybe the most in, uh, challenging you have to argue and find a new way of financing between the institutions, the research council, and the government. And the most challenging for the government and the research council is that you cannot use the competitive principle. Or who should you compete uh, with and against? So for the matter of principle, I, I can tell you that they were thinking about that we should break our uh, national team into four so that they that formally we could compete, and we didn't want to do that. So, um, institutional traditions and rules and marking behaviors may result in gaps uh, and low national efficiency. But the national team necessarily needs to overcome these impediments. And for the specific question, it provides uh, the best of the notion can provide. And I think it also it releases unforeseen synergy. As compared to the outcome, the financial efficiency, I think, uh, is high. And there is a danger in what I hear in quotation marks call institutionalism. Mm -hmm. One well, my question, if competition is the one and only strategy to select the best of any challenge. So then some people say that $97 million uh, is a lot of money, and uh, I uh, agree. But I will also tell you that the Nansen legacy costs peanuts. The costs are less than 1% of Norway's earning from the landing of fish of the Barents Sea during six years. And this is just the start of the profit chain. If somebody asks you, uh, you, uh, you earned $100, can you invest $1 to have uh, uh, your business running also in 10, 20 years? You will say yes. But when the price tag is $97 million, uh, then the government or the research council will say this is far too much. But these are the proportions we are talking about by the research we are doing. So the Nansen legacy is a very small investment to maintain the benefits of sustainable ecosystem and one of the major industries of Norway. Fisheries is uh, 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 number three on the state budget in Norway. And if we sold all the fish uh, of uh, Norway to the United States, we could, uh, we could provide 18% of your dinners. 18, one eight. And we are only 5 million people. So it's a major thing. And at the same time, Norway also advances its crucial uh, Arctic expertise and recruits scientists, uh, which the nation actually needs. And finally, the Nansen legacy is a major contribution to pan Arctic integration, the work that all Arctic coastal states need to perform in the future. Right now, you see border lines. They pre prevent very much this Arctic integration because the various nations work in their various sectors. Right. 
So then uh, I come to the end of my talk and uh, I, um, Norway is the way north, it must mean, and uh, Norway and um, feels a passionate, uh, very passionate about its north. And this has nothing to do with science, so I present you uh, a poem. <laughs> Look more often to the north, go against the wind, you get redder cheeks. <laughs> Find the rugged path, hold it, it's shorter. North is best. Winter sky in flames, summer night, sun miracle. Go against the wind, climb mountains, look to the north more often. It's farthest country. Most of it is north. Yeah. And um, as compared to the United States, which has uh, the separation between the main states and, and Arctic, uh, Norway is the way north, there's a continuity to, to the north. That means that the Arctic for us uh, is, is a much more emotional or industrial or population-wise, much more integrated part of that. Yeah. Yes, and, um, and at the very end, I also would like to make a personal comment. Uh, I'm not from Norway, and it was a pleasure for me as a foreigner uh, to work for a national uh, research team uh, in Norway and contribute to the uh, to, to that. And I'm um, I've been living more than 40 years in Norway. I'm from Germany, and um, Germany devastated North Norway uh, enormously during the Second World War. So that I can make a contribution to the development of the North. Is also something which has been very important for me. That's what I wanted to say. Thank you so much, Paul, uh, for your presentation. Are there any questions here in the room? John and Matt? I, I have a couple, but I'll start with one. You say the goal is, is sustainability, and you define that as carrying capacity. Of, um, of these major fisheries to cod. And you will have an answer by 2023, it seemed, based on your slides, you see that's when permitting will begin. Am I correct so far? Yeah. How do you know you'll have an answer on the carrying capacity by that date? Um. We uh, feel pretty sure that the uh, Norwegian coastal waters and the Barents Sea are pretty much in what we call uh, carrying capacity, meaning uh, the uh, let's say the the extraction and the production uh, is in phase of a uh, lengthy enough period, which means decades, because for the southern regions we have time uh, lines or time series for 20, 30, 40 years. Um, but they are, of course, changing because of climate change. Mm -hmm. And then you, for example, with regard to uh, fisheries, you tune your catch uh, and uh, your allowances uh, through multi-species uh, models to figure out that you don't uh, overdo. In the 80s, Norway, for example, was in a much worse situation. Uh, than, than now. So this ecosystem type 10 thinking has uh, uh, been very be beneficial uh, for, for the long-term development. And when I say 23, uh, 23 I say then, then you have uh, the data to evaluate the sustainability. Because then somebody says, okay, we are drilling oil there, or we do mining, or like that. Then you have to figure out what kind of effluents and how many uh, hydro hydrocarbons or uh, drill spill and like comes out. And uh, then you use um, that knowledge uh, for the specific organisms you use to test that. And you know then how many organisms there are of that species, how much they grow when the growth season is, you know all that. So then you are in a, in a possibility to evaluate it. 
you cannot guarantee anything, but you give you provide your knowledge to the government, which has to make a decision to what extent that um, industrial activity uh, uh, is detrimental to the environment, which is often are, but to what extent and if you can uh, go for that and take the risk. Was that an answer to what? Mm, oh. Kind of. <laughs> what well, can I pick up on? This is not my original question, but can I pick up on what John was uh, asking? 2023 is when the oil and gas corporations could start applying for licenses, but they may not be granted for a number of years because it would require study based on your data. The 2023 is the time when the, you, the government can evaluate uh, the ecological status of the waters because then they have the database which we think they need to have. Right, so the government isn't going to start granting licenses in 2023. Not, not at all. A long time after. Not, it's not sure that they will get any license. They may, may never. It's just, it, uh, it is what I try to, maybe that's not the right word, but that, that is what I try to put into this uh, word to become operational, meaning that you can operate uh, or you can evaluate the consequences of your planned uh, 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 operations. Got it. Um, the U.S. National Academy of Sciences evaluation of the research plan, um, is that a confidential document? Is it held only by the Research Council and the government? Or is it, is it a public document? I, um, among us, uh, and we are many, it is not a, 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 a closed or private document. But could anyone in this room see it? Or is it only uh, available in Norway to Nansen legacy scientists and the government? That I have to ask. I don't think so, but uh, I have to ask uh, Marit uh, how she is dealing with that. Okay. Was it done by the Ocean Studies Board? I don't think. Maybe it was joint polar yeah, and ocean I, studies. I thought it was interesting to say that you got the highest marks from the NAO. Uh, I, I don't know if they give marks. They make findings and sometimes recommendations. Very oh, big marks oh. when it was again maybe not the right but they, they they said that this is excellent and we highly recommend it and this and this and this is good and maybe you could look at this this uh, uh, the the highest marks in the was just my wording for the the final paragraph. For the, did did they make recommendations that were then used to revise the science plan? Yeah, some. Mm -hmm. uh, they had uh, oh, that is some more the funny stories that so they had uh, uh, thought that some of the females were males. Oh, so you needed to increase uh, so your. <laughs> Maybe you should look for a uh, <laughs> female he doesn't like that. <laughs> Randy in Norwegian is, for example, uh, a female name. <laughs> Martin, you come. Uh, thanks. I remember when uh, you visited the National Science Foundation a few years ago to tell us about the Nansen Legacy Project as it was developing, obviously, at that time. And I seem to recall that you mentioned how um, you welcome the participation of overseas scientists and a certain number of births might be made available on the Crown Prince Hawken and so on. Is that still the case? And how would overseas scientists get involved? Yes, that, uh, that is um, uh, not any more so much the case than it was at that time. Because at that time, um, um, we looked at the capacity, for example, on this ship here and said, well, uh, there will be uh, some births uh, awakened uh, all the time. But once the science plan was made and the institutions got ignited by uh, all the things and possibilities they had, uh, they filled up that boat. There aren't enough births now. Yes. <laughs> so, uh, but that uh, does not mean that uh, 
uh, that the foreign science scientists and are not welcome on Norwegian ships. There have always been many scientists on our ships. And um, so this ship has uh, just a uh, talk about the details here. This ship has 35 berths for uh, scientists. Uh, at the same time, the, for the next two or three or four years, the University of Tromsø keeps on going with the present ice going vessel, which is called Helma Hansen, which has 28 berths. And the University of Tromsø alone has six month ship time on this vessel. And then we have um, the other vessel, uh, at least 180 days a year. And there is also a, a private uh, uh, company which uh, builds a 200 meter long research vessel, which they will put uh, 40, uh, four months a year to the disposal of, of scientists. And it will operate wherever in the world. So uh, there, is, uh, there is space <laughs> on Norwegian vessels but not particular on these Nansen legacy legs because they are now filled with enthusiastic, <laughs> not so enthusiastic still when I was there. <laughs> Let me check if we have uh, questions on the phone. Are there any questions um, for Paul on the phone? Yeah, this is uh, Jim Overland from, you know, uh, thanks a lot. Paul, uh, I was really uh, interested in your experience about institutions because I think uh, why search did not get going in the 1990s uh, to look at the beginning of our change was that that we didn't have all, we had a good bottom up part, but not all the institutions on board. Um, Jim, uh, we couldn't hear you uh, well. Can you repeat your question? Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, yes, go ahead, please. Sorry. Okay. Hi, Paul. Thanks for the uh, the talk. Uh, I think your, your comments on uh, your experience with institutions was uh, really important because I think the reason we didn't get search going to look at uh, the beginning of Arctic change was uh, lack of having all the institutions on board and, and, and moving from a uh, competition to uh, an integrated program. Can I ask Jim a question? Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Jim, do you think that the approach that Norway took with Nansen Legacy and succeeded, obviously, do you think that would work here in the United States? Would you be willing to try? Yeah, I'm, uh, it, it, make, it makes some sense. I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, 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 well, yeah, maybe so, because the problem with was search was to get all the interdisciplinary uh, groups on on board, and that 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 uh, seemed to uh, help kill it. Okay. Can I ask a question about the data? Sure, go ahead. So you mentioned data in one of the slides of the data legacy. So how is data being handled within the consortium of partners and then availability elsewhere? There's one institution, uh, I think the Meteorological Institution, which will handle uh, all the data. They were also the ones who handled all the data on the IPY, like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, they have an obligation, I don't know the details here, at that time they had the obligation to make uh, data available for the consortium uh, 
or maybe even internationally in one year's time. Okay. So, um, so this is a, this is a dedicated task for one institution uh, to do that, and uh, we have had a very good experience uh, with them, and it's because of that uh, we selected uh, them. Okay. That's an, 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 an uh, this is an essential part of of that project. Part of the division of labor you were talking before. Yeah. Yeah. So the the three principles were important to us to find the common base to uh, to cooperate. And uh, when I talk here, I talk about the Nansen legacy and what we did in Norway. Now, if you are 320 million people or five million people. And if fisheries and oceanic work is small or big, all that is very different in different countries. Mm -hmm. And also the tradition in various countries are different. Okay. So if I still think that uh, concerted action and uh, joint ventures uh, by whatever principle uh, are an important thing. And I'm, uh, but here, there, of course, I'm I'm not in tune what the what the general rule in the United States is. I am not convinced that competition will always increase the quality. Yeah. yeah. That's uh, and but then then of course I cannot say how how, how you would uh, try to address something like, like that. It yeah. probably had to be another oh boy. format. Yeah. Are there any other questions on the phone? In the room? Paul, I should have started by congratulating you on this because it's, it's, it's quite impressive what you've been able to do and to bring this to fruition. So congratulations to you and, and best of success to the project now that's in the implementation phase and we look forward very much to seeing what happens over the next five years and i also like in terms of working on large cooperative projects your comment about it's not necessarily competition sometimes a monopoly can be helpful <laughs> uh but a, a, a question i was impressed by there's 120 to 130 people working on this and there's going to be 50 new positions did I yeah. hear that correct? That's a huge, that's almost a 40% increase. And these will be sustained beyond this project or are they only for this project? Probably they will be just, just, uh, sustained because uh, Norway in these years uh, uh, loses 65%, 65 seniors, ah. for example, me. <laughs> okay, so it's replacing. Yeah, it is. Uh, if you want to keep the number of people in Arctic science uh, similar to what we know, and we need rather more than less people in the future, then you have to make sure that all, all the old guys, uh, which were recruited earlier, uh, that there is replacement. Doesn't mean doesn't mean that there are Norwegian replacements, but there's at least you could be, of course, foreign replacement. But uh, you have to, you know, it's like a pyramid. Yeah. You lose this part you have to fill up in the bottom to keep your workforce or your expertise or capacity going. Okay, so you won't have 180 people five years from now. No. You may still have 130, but there's some support for people coming yeah. up the ranks. Ah, okay. Okay. I see. Okay. And, you know, the only other thing that struck me about this is uh, what's, what appears to be uh, a lack of... Uh, international uh, scientists involved in the actual project. But I would imagine that as the data become available, as the scientists begin to work on the data and on the modeling, they will engage with international partners in the process. Is, is that about right? If you look at, the, there is an international science advisory panel. Mm -hmm. uh, and there is also a reference group, of stakeholders that on the, on exactly. the site. Uh, and those have been selected, and they were there in, in March. And okay. uh, of course, uh, despite the fact that this is a pretty national yeah. scope, uh, we do it into inside a, a, as most international uh, uh, envelope or, or frame as possible. So, so that, that's a good question because I think there's been coordination with DBO 
in, in, and with the Pacific Arctic Group, correct? That may be. I have I have not been involved in the last two years in all the details. Okay. But uh, if you make contact with Marit, which in, in, in June, she will uh, be able to tell you all the details and the contract negotiation and all the details. The entire document is very detailed to make sure that a priori everybody knows what he and she and the institution has to do so that you don't get into some kind of dogfight uh, in the middle of the project. Paul, here in the here in the U.S., we have a lot of um, support for developing um, private public partnerships. Um, is the Nansen legacy involving or, or getting support or somehow connecting to the private sector? Uh, we try to keep uh, the stakeholders, meaning uh, fisheries. Uh, companies, uh, oil and gas chemical companies and others uh, of tourism informed stakeholder meetings. Now the um, one of the problems the Research Council uh, had uh, with that is that um, we started with eight partners and the eight still partners, partners are still the main partners but then at towards the end uh, the Research Council thought uh, that um, uh, two uh, private partners should be coming to the consortium more I think as a matter of principle because these private partners could only be very small partners because the entry ticket was 50% of the funding had to come from the institution so private partners uh, can participate on the uh, if they are interested to do that but they have to pay uh, 50 percent uh, of that. So, um, so we have maybe less uh, private partners uh, in the Norwegian system, but some of them are really good. The uh, mm -hmm. the, the uh, Aquaplaniva is really uh, really good, and the NERC, which is the remote sensing Nansen Center in Bergen, is also a world class. Okay. These are these are not industry or private sector partners in the traditional sense, and there would be a conflict of interest there. I would have thought <clears throat> that since the Nansen Legacy Project, uh, the goal is to provide the environmental information to make licensing decisions, licensing industry to operate, then to have industry partners with you at this stage might be a bit odd. No, no, it's not an industry partner. It's a private research organisation. Yes, I know, but for the but. I understand that, but to have um, Statoil or that kind of corporation as a private partner at this stage, no, they are not that would be a, the that would be a conflict of interest, yeah, since they're regulated. Yes, but uh, what we had discussed with Statoil in particular is that uh, we know their uh, their toxic to toxicity uh, uh, algorithms. Uh, what kind of model to have of test organisms like that. and uh, we told them we work on that on this type of things of, 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 of interest for you this is what you need to do that and uh, and maybe you need something more and if you would like to do this something more very efficiently some with us then you could enter the consortium and pay for this uh, under on, basic science research and they uh, were interested but uh, nothing came out of it I think when Guillermo says private he means corporate and it could be private like Woods Hole is private yeah, yeah. well your yeah, actual plan is a private as Paul said it's a private research organization right, right. it's not a corporation in the right. share, shareholding profit so I think it's yeah. And one of the particular things with them and other organization in Norway is that uh, private ones is that um, so as a goal, Aquaplan is trying to do 50% of their revenue or their turnover through basic science, which is financed by the research council. So they are private, uh, but they are also uh, a, an operator like uh, everybody else on marine sciences. And that is also true with, uh, with NERC. Okay. So they are
they have some kind of mixed uh, economy. They have a private side and then they have the, uh, a, a public side. We have time for one more quick question, if any. If not, uh, thank you, Paul, again. Thank you very much.